All right, good morning and welcome to Emerald Ashbor University. And it's coming to you live from my office at Michigan State University. My name is Robin Osborne and along with my colleagues, Adam Witt from Purdue University and Amy Stone from The Ohio State University, we hope that you'll find this webinar informative. Today, Michael Rupp from the University of Maryland at College Park will talk to us about invasions by non-native insect pests and arboriculture. Mike is a professor and extension specialist who is internationally recognized as an expert on the ecology and management of insects and mites. He has appeared on all major television networks and has been featured on the Science Channel, National Geographic, Dr. Oz, and Jay Leno. His website is called Bug of the Week and is a source of information on the natural history of insects, and it has received more than a million visits so far. Mike has received a dozen regional or national awards for excellence in ex extension programming and media communications, including the Secretary of Agriculture's Award for Environmental Protection and the Entomological Society's Achievement Award in Extension. His most recent book, 26 Things That Bug Me, introduces youngsters to, a, to the wonders of insects and natural history using pictures and rhymes. Today's presentation is one of more than 900 that Mike has made, so I'm sure we'll be learning a lot. I uh, just wanted to let you know, if you have questions during the webinar, please feel free to type them in the chat pod. We'll be making a note of them, and Mike will be responding to questions after the presentation. That keeps the flow of the webinar going smoothly. Please stay tuned until the end because we would like to get your feedback and we will be providing a link to a survey that we'd like you to participate in. As well, for those of you needing CEUs, your survey information is necessary for us to process those CEUs. The first 10 people to participate will receive an EAB goodie bag. Even if you've received a goodie bag in the past, we appreciate your continued feedback on this webinar as well. This webinar is being recorded and it will be available for viewing this week at www.emeraldashborer.info. You will also find the recordings for all previous EAB University webinars there. And please give us your feedback about you because we are always want to know how we can make these and better. Thank you for attending today. And with that, I'll bring up Mike's presentation. He can unmute his mic and we will begin. Okay, um, can you folks hear me? Hello? Hello. Hello, Robin. <laughs> I, I'm, am I unmuted? You are unmuted. You're doing good. Okay, fantastic. Well, I'm going to be the first one to complete that survey so I can get one of the goodie bags. No question. So I encourage all the rest of you to do the same. Good morning and welcome from the University of Maryland. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here today uh, to conduct this, uh, this uh, webinar. It should be good fun. Um, what I would suggest is uh, I'm going to go off, uh, off the reservation here just a little bit, Robin. And if you folks have questions as I go along, uh, please feel free to type those in. I'll try to deal with them because, you know, I just hate waiting. Uh, and I'm sure that some of you hate waiting, too. If it gets out of hand, uh, then we'll cut it off and hold questions for the end. But I'll try to get to your questions uh, as we go along. Okay, so fair enough. Uh, this presentation entitled Aliens in Our Myths is kind of a spin-off of uh, a couple presentations I've made for the International Society of Arboriculture and Tree Care Industry, um, one of which resulted in a publication uh, in um, the Arborist News, I believe, that is available online. So with that, let's get started and talk a little bit about uh, some of the... Um, some of the issues associated with invasive species, particularly invasive insect pests. 
Now, I'd like to put this in a broader context first, and that is the fact that these alien insects really contribute uh, two important ways to the sustainability of our urban forests. Uh, there are a number of issues which we won't have an opportunity to get into today uh, in great detail. One is this issue of the lack of biodiversity that we face along urbanization gradients. Climate change, we'll hold that one for an another time. And some of the other factors that contribute to pest outbreaks and reduce the sustainability. But for now, let's focus on items two and three how the importation of these exotic pests, these invasive species, and how the substitution of exotic plants for native plants can contribute to insect pest outbreaks. Some of the terminology I'll use today will focus on this, and I, there are many different definitions, but for the purposes of today, I'm going to talk about native plants as ones that are indigenous to the United States. Non-natives are, uh, I'll use synonymously with the term alien and exotic, uh, in my opinion, uh, non-native does not necessarily mean invasive. Uh, for example, one of the things I hate the worst is an invasive plant, which I call poison ivy. Uh, this is a native to North America, but invasive nonetheless. So I'm going to be talking about invasives uh, primarily um, in an ecological uh, process context rather than a point of origin. Uh, and as I've pointed out here, invasives can be both non-native or non-native. Okay, so these are the terms that I'll use during the course of this discussion. Well, first of all, to get to this point is what's native and what's alien. And I think what we have is kind of a, a oh, I don't know, a bit of an ecological bias when we talk about these particular terms. Uh, if we go back to a mere, oh, maybe 250 million years ago, when the uh, continents were united in a supercontinent called Pangaea, this business about native and non-native really becomes a moot point, doesn't it? And we have to keep in mind that in 250 million years from today, when the next supercontinent forms, I guess all this argument goes away. So we have to look at this, I think, in a broader context, but we'll talk primarily in terms of ecological context today. But always keep in mind that this all depends simply on time and space. Now, one of the things that I always find curious uh, is distributions of plants. One of our most commonly used uh, plants here in Maryland, of course, is uh, Gladetsia, the honey locust. Is it native to Maryland? Well, is it native to Chicago? Well, if you look at the map here, you can see that the answer to this, well, probably is no. So even though we have plants that we sometimes consider uh, native, really the distributions are often shifted. This happens with great regularity uh, in the construction of urban forests. So again, this business of what's native and what's not really depends on uh, human intervention, time and space, I think. So let's take all this native and non-native stuff a bit with a grain of salt here and, uh, and um, try to put things uh, perhaps in an ecological context. Well, we kind of have the feeling, or I used to have the feeling, that the rate of importation of these exotic species was ever increasing. And then I made the mistake, uh, as we're wont to do from time to time, to dig into the literature. And I found in a very interesting paper by Akama et al., uh, published a couple years ago, that actually the rate is not increasing. The rate has been more or less stable uh, for these non-indigenous forest insect pests and also for the high impact pests, which would include things like emerald ash borer and Asian longhorn beetle. These uh, rates really have be, been relatively constant from a period of about the 1860s on, which I found rather surprising. But we'll dig into this in a little bit more detail now. Uh, I, some of you may be wondering, or I'll put this question out there, what was it about 1860 that basically took us from a slow progression from the early 1600s to uh, where we are today at, at 2013. Does anybody want to wager a guess on this? 
I would invite you to just type in your guess right now, if anybody is so bold to do so. Gene Scott is typing as we speak. What do you think, Gene? What was it? Uh, the Industrial Revolution. Uh, the Civil War expansion. Nick, good way. Well, it's a little bit of both, but I think you guys hit it on the head. Um, really, what uh, the major source of this was, I think, is this right here. It was the invention of the steel hold ship, which allowed us to cross great oceans in a matter of days rather than a matter of months or weeks. And what this did was it brought about a great expansion in international exploration. This is the time that uh, David Douglas and the great explorers uh, that were uh, constrained earlier uh, in our history were able to move out across the world seeking new plants for cultivation, new crops, and new ornamental plants to add to collections throughout the world. So really it was the invention of the steel hold ship and the steam engine, I think, that kicked this era off. So nice work, uh, Gene and Nick. Um, but what did this mean eventually? Well, if we look back through history, and I want to talk about North American history now, we can see that it was very short time after the initial colonization uh, of North America here, uh, let me say the European colonization rather than the great migrations of Native Americans across the Bering Strait. But let's, let's go from the time of uh, kind of post-Columbian history here. And in 1635, we had our first pest, and it was indeed a tree pest. It was the coddling moth, uh, brought over by the colonists, and Johnny Appleseed had already done his work, so they had hosts here. This was then followed uh, in a period from about 1820 to 1860, and this was largely beetles that were coming over in the ballast of sailing ships. Remember that um, many of the cities we live in are paved with Belgian block. Uh, oftentimes soil and other types of material were used as ballast in these ships. And this provided a vehicle for beetles to colonize North America. The 1860s saw our first urban pest, the gypsy moth, uh, E. Leopold Trevelot uh, in Massachusetts. This was a deliberate introduction. Uh, an attempt basically to breed the gypsy moth from France uh, with silkworms and produce silk in light of the embargo during the American Civil War. The next big wave came with the scale insects, and many of these arrived in the 1890s to 1930s. Again, as we increased foreign exploration and tried to incorporate new kinds of plants uh, for amenity horticulture and food production here in the United States. On the heels of this invasion were the aphids, again, another big group of sucking insects that were coming in, uh, again, on horticultural crops. Uh, from the 1900 to the 1940s, we saw a real upswing in the foliage feeders, caterpillars, sawflies, and beetles. The 1980s and through 2006, and this is where uh, the article basically, my reviews basically began to drop off, was a predominance of flow and feeding and wood boring beetles. So this is really kind of the era we're in right now, and we'll spend a little bit more time talking about this in just a moment. But that composition graph I showed you before that showed the steady increase really is a composite of several waves of different groups of insects colonizing North America. So the appearance or the impression is that we're, we're simply having more things, um, I think is, is not entirely true. What we're seeing is things coming in in waves. When you look at the temporal composite of this, it basically forms an ever-increasing line. Now, you can also see in this graph, and this is economic data, which is sometimes easier to get than biological data, that right about in the middle of the 1980s, uh, again, we began to have this rapid increase in imports in this country through a change in trade agreements. 
And if we now look at this graph, the cumulative number of established invasive scolited species, you can see kind of an uptick right past 1956, which kind of corresponds with the uh, upswing in the uh, importation of uh, foreign crops, um, foreign goods to this country. And this really, I think, is the reason we have the impression uh, that things are getting worse uh, and perhaps at a greater rate because we're kind of in an era right now of these egregious wood boring beetles, including things uh, like these scolitids, buprestids, and cerambicids, which are causing us so much grief right now. How did the exotic invaders arrive? Well, I've already mentioned a couple ways, but I think a really, really good read, and this is kind of the impression we have, is that many of them are coming in on containers, uh, dunnage, uh, crating material, pallets and such for things like EAB and ALB. But a wonderful study that was done by Sandy Liebold and some of his co-authors basically demonstrated that at least for the poor forest pest invasions, it really is the live plants that are coming in uh, through our ports of entry, uh, coming in for horticultural purposes or amenity purposes that really, really are the primary mode of entry of many, many different types of insects into the country right now. So again, by far the insects are the dominant ones here, uh, dwarfing things like uh, the diseases, mollusks, and weeds. And of the group, well, this is no surprise, is it, gang? Anybody that's listening from Florida or uh, for that matter, below the Mason-Dixon or on the West Coast knows that homopterans uh, are, are easily uh, imported. Uh, many of these are cryptic, they're small, they're hard to find. And it's not surprising um, that they, they're traveling in with plant material um, as a primary way to get into this country. Okay. Well, to get to a bigger question, come back to this a little bit. Well, why should we really care about establishment of exotic species in North America? Well, this graph or this image uh, basically gives some sense of, of the, you know, the vine that ate the south, kudzu, uh, the problems with things like uh, ivy in the lower right-hand corner in California, Norway maple in New England, Ely Agnes in the bottom left, and if you drive around the Beltway in spring, all you see is solid white because it's now basically a forest of um, escaped uh, Bradford pears. So, uh, you know, this will have certain consequences uh, in terms of ecosystem services and ecosystem processes, and that's where I'd like to move now a little bit. So, we're going to kind of talk about food webs here a little bit. Uh, this is one that I, I borrowed from my uh, general biology lectures and, and talk about what some of the impacts are of not only invasive plants or exotic plants, um, but also exotic insects on ecosystem services and processes. Uh, for some of you that were at Canuga uh, a couple years ago, I'm now going to uh, uh, relate information that uh, Dan and Paula Shrewsbury uh, have contributed to some of our thoughts on this and basically run through it. We can view this, this relationship between the native plants and the native insects in, as sign of a coevolutionary matrix. Uh, we have native plants, native insects, exotic plants, exotic insects, exotic plants, native insects, and native plants, exotic insects. And let's talk about these things a little bit. As Dan has suggested, when we have this coevolutionary match, that is native plants and native insects, oftentimes these associations tend to be more or less stable unless there are other disruptive elements. So in situations like this, here's a liriodendron, a tulip poplar. Uh, it's at a lake site near my home. I've watched this thing go through cycles of outbreaks of uh, uh, tulip tree scale. Uh, I've seen the, uh, the hyperaspis beetles come in, the ladybird beetles come in and, and annihilate these scales. So we basically have a situation where periodically the scale insect, the soft scale insect will outbreak, but then we have the natural enemy come in and gobble these things up and things kind of return more or less to a stable state. That tree right now is in great shape. <laughs> 
We have a situation where we have exotic plants and exotic insects and oftentimes this combination is devastating because it results in enemy release. In other words, uh, all of you I think are familiar with situations like Euonymus and Euonymus scale. Um, we bring in an exotic plant with its exotic uh, pest in the absence of its natural enemies and we simply have the recipe for disaster outbreaks. Eucalyptus longhorn beetle again in California on the west coast. Uh, major problems and we see these types of situations over and over again azaleas and azalea lice bugs so when we have an enemy release it's not at all unusual to see outbreaking populations and these are particularly severe in urban landscapes where we may have kind of a loss of natural enemy regulation how do we know it's an enemy release? Well, one good example, of course, is the gypsy moth in the east. We saw the devastation of our native forests here with the importation of gypsy moth. But once we were able to import a very effective biological control agent, uh, in this case, Entomophaga myomyga, we now simply don't have a major problem with gypsy moth any longer here in the east. The entomophaga simply destroys those populations and most years it's able to suppress them. And again, this is just evidence that once we reunite the natural enemy with its target pest, we often can simply make these uh, mismatches disappear and kind of level the playing field with the exotic pests and the exotic plants. So from a period from, uh, or in this case, uh, our own plants, but in, in this case, we've seen the defoliation decline dramatically from 1990 to 1996 after the importation and establishment of the entomophaga. The ash white fly, another good example from the west coast. Uh, this was a devastating pest, basically clouding the cities, uh, Riverside and some of the cities out west. But within two years after the release of this tiny wasp, uh, this pest basically has become inconsequential. If any of you have visited Southern California recently, you see the ash trees and Bradford pears are in really good shape now. And again, just evidence of what can happen when we reunite the natural enemy from the native realm um, with that pest in the invaded realm. Okay, let's skip now to a little bit more complicated situation where we have exotic plants and native insects. And this is one uh, that Elton first wrote about uh, many, many years ago back in the 1930s. Basically what happens with community uh, simplification and defense-free space. I wanna talk about these issues. So basically, some exotic plants support few or no herbivores, things like Bradford pears, certain honeysuckles, and our friend the ginkgo. What we know is that oftentimes there's greater biodiversity associated with native plants. For example, if we look at the number of species of butterflies, Lepidoptera, found on native and exotic plants, the little bar chart in the lower left corner here, both the number and the abundance, the number of species and the actual abundance of individuals is greater on the native plants than on exotic plants. Now, this work has largely been championed, uh, as some of you may be familiar with, uh, by one of my colleagues, uh, Doug Tallamy, uh, at the University of Maryland, I'm sorry, at the University of Delaware. And, oh boy, let me see if I can advance this slide. I've lost my ability here to advance slides. Hold on, bear with me, here we go. Um, and uh, what Doug and others have found is that as we increase the number of butterfly species on the y-axis, we'll find a corresponding correlation with the number of bird species that we see in any given habitat. And birds, of course, are important predators of many of the uh, major pests, as well as butterflies, uh, that we find in our urban uh, ecosystems. So to Doug's point, basically what he is suggesting is when we introduce these exotic plants, what we do is um, 
what we do is basically uncouple that relationship between native plants and their herbivores. What this does is result in depauperate communities of predators and perhaps parasitoids, allowing some of these um, pests to, to outbreak. Okay, so we basically lose this top-down regulation when we bring in exotic plants because many exotic plants will not serve as effective hosts for our native insects. There's a little bit different spin on this particular relationship between exotic plants and native insects, and I want to talk about this a little bit in the context of what we call defense-free space. Um, Defense-free space, I think one of the great examples uh, of this uh, happens, um, again, we see examples of this from the pathology world, and, and perhaps some of our clearest examples are there. Uh, just to see if you guys are awake, there's another little pop quiz coming up here, gang. Uh, can anybody tell me what these trees are? And notice there are actually human beings uh, standing at the base of these trees. They're not hobbits. They're actually full-size human beings. I see uh, Gene is, is um, oh, very good. Every, well, look at this. Christine's got it. Greg's got it. Gene and John. Very good. These are American chestnuts. Excellent. One of my favorite pictures. One of my favorite pictures. But everybody knows that the, uh, this magnificent tree was once distributed from New England uh, down almost to the Gulf of Mexico. But unfortunately, we imported a very virulent pathogen the chestnut blight accidentally through New York in the 1990s, and by 1940, three and a half billion chestnuts were dead. So here we have a situation where we had a naive host, in other words, a host that had never shared a coevolutionary experience with this chestnut blight, and once the chestnut blight was introduced, it simply was able to have its way and decimate the populations of American chestnuts. So the point I think that um, that is being made with our chestnuts, and we see another classic example here, not in a native system or an unmanaged system, but in an urban system. Uh, these are American elms at my study site up in Central Park. Uh, we all know what happened when we introduced the smaller European elm bark beetle, which was a component a vector for Ophistoma. We lost somewhere around 400, four, excuse me, 40 million elm trees and still counting here in North America. Um, we can see other examples of this coevolutionary mismatch. One of the very best studies of this was the wonderful work done by Dave Nielsen, um, Vanessa Muhlenberg, and Dan Herms over a very long period of time. Uh, those of you who have been around this business long enough um, remember the tales back in the day of the wonderful and amazing white birch trees from Asia and Europe that were going to solve the problem with the bronze birch borer here in North America. We we're going to import these wonderful trees and they would be resistant to the bronze birch borer. Well, if we kind of harken back now to a, a second about this, uh, these examples I've given you with the Dutch elm disease and the American chestnut blight, eh, maybe if we had thought this through, there might have been a different kind of uh, scenario here to this story. At one of the very, very best research uh, pieces ever done on this, this was a 20-year study done at, out at OARDC, I think, initiated by Dave Nielsen, one of the real pioneers in IPM. He basically set up these research plots with the native species uh, and four of these exotic species. And what Dave uh, and uh, Dan Herms found is was over the 20-year uh, time horizon, and I guess this isn't really surprising, that really it was our native birches that were the survivors. It was the exotic birches that all took it on the chin. So in other words, when we have this coevolutionary mismatch between a plant and an herbivore, don't be surprised if the herbivore 
whether it's a, an insect or a pathogen, is just going to clobber that naive plant because it's simply the plant simply doesn't have the defenses. It simply hasn't spent 20 million years duking it out with these boring insects. So it's the coevolutionary mismatch, I think, uh, is the one that often results in the pest outbreak when we have this exotic plant um, and uh, introduced species um, or this, this mismatch between a, a naive plant and a new herbivore of some type. That's the, that's the real one we have to worry about here. Okay, so no evolutionary history, no resistance. And I think this has been very well documented now in a whole series of studies. Um, again, I thank Dan for providing this slide, but bronze birch borer, emerald ash borer, pine needle scale, the list simply goes on and on. Good examples of the coevolutionary mismatch and what can happen when an herbivore arrives on a plant in what we call defense free space. Defense free space, in other words, being that space provided by the plant, which simply does not have the co evolved defenses to be able to ward off an insect or disease. Uh, this was a term introduced by um, Dan and Kamal Gandhi in a very important paper, and I think it really helps me understand a lot what goes on with these uh, invasive species situations. Okay, does it happen for emerald ash borer? Well, what do you guys think? Uh, well, kind of spill over here since this is EAB uh, University and talk a little bit about this. You're all very much aware of the enormous economic impacts that this particular pest has levied uh, on plants here in North America. Uh, I think the estimate is up to something like 50, perhaps as many as 50 million trees killed now or something like this. But again, in terms of this defense-free space, some very, very nice work done by Eric Rebeck, uh, Cliff Sadoff, and, and Dan Herms and his colleagues. Here we have the North American ash, and we have the Asian ash, the Manchurica. Well, let's put them in the competition. Let's see what happens. Uh, who's going to be more resistant? Are the North American ashes going to be able to withstand the exotic pest, or is the Asian ash going to be more able to withstand the Asian pest? Does anybody care to weigh in on that one? Who wins? North American ashes or Asian ashes? Nick is typing. Multiple attendees. Uh, Greg's saying Asian. G okay, Nick is saying... Manchurian, Asian. Well, at least you guys are paying attention and everybody's still awake. Okay, good. Uh, it's surprising that sometimes uh, when we do this little uh, quiz that um, I'm always surprised by the answers, but yeah. So basically some very nice work. Again, I think this is uh, maybe Eric uh, Ribbick's work, but again, showing that the North American ashes, which lack that coevolutionary history, with this egregious bore, they're the ones that are going to be able to take. They're the ones that are going to take it on the chin. Whereas the Manchurian ash, which has been slugging it out over there in Asia for a long period of time, they're going to have the resistance built in. Okay, we don't need to belabor this point any further. I think let's move ahead. Um, what's at stake? Well, in this particular problem, uh, again, we're concerned that we we may. Uh, face the the extirpation not only of white and green ash but I think there are something like perhaps as many as 12 different species of Fraxinus here in North America this is most distressing uh, from that standpoint um, but beyond that uh, are other implications which we'll circle back to in just a few minutes here um, one of the things I've been involved with in America, uh, here in Maryland is basically trying to help our urban foresters uh, understand what some of the implications of the emerald ash borer are. And in kind of a, mm, let's say, in a preemptive way, plan for what might happen in the future. Uh, in my way of thinking, a couple pieces of information needed to make these decisions include things like, uh, you know, what, what, how many ash are you dealing with in your municipality? And of course, one of the tools that uh, is very, very important uh, in making these kind of decisions is, is the uh, iTree software, uh, that open source, 
open source software that allows us to do things like conduct surveys, estimate our population size, uh, and some of the benefits um, and costs associated with management here. So that's what I want to speak about briefly next. Um, we've conducted this for a few cities here in Maryland, Bowie, Annapolis, Greater Upper Marlboro. Uh, used eye trees to help conduct our sample. Uh, some of you may, I, I hope, are familiar with the eye tree software. It simply is a wonderful tool. Uh, it allows us to estimate our population size. And we can also use this then to generate the benefits, the benefits associated with uh, the ASH population. Uh, these benefits translate in things like energy savings, um, carbon dioxide sequestration, air quality, stormwater reme remediation, and the aesthetic value. Uh, rather than go through the whole uh, enchilada here, I think what I'd, I'd simply ask you guys to do is focus uh, in table number two. This is a publication we re recently uh, put out for the uh, Marin Entomological Society. Make a note here that for the city of Annapol Annapolis, the Estimated annual benefits, again, every year, the ash population in Annapolis is believed to contribute something about, oh, $152,000, okay? Now, if we go down to the cost side, the cumulative cost side, and the other very, very useful and, and wonderful tool, uh, of course, is the EAB cost calculator uh, that Cliff put together. This is a fantastic piece of software which everybody should be familiar with, uh, I think, when you make these management decisions. Um, if we go down now to the Annapolis scenario, uh, and we look across the different kind of management plans, remove all, replace all, treat all, replace uh, those less than 24 and treat the others, or the urban slam uh, approach, which in my way of thinking is perhaps the most, uh, most viable and the most sensible, we can see that the cumulative cost here over five years is only going to be about $54,000. Now, if we look at that cost, that five-year cost of 54, and we compare it to the annual cost here in Annapolis, the annual benefit, excuse me, of 153 more or less, it's basically a no-brainer. Uh, you know, the, the benefit of the ash population in Annapolis and these other cities is enormous. And what makes sense is to have that progressive treat, treatment of a certain portion of the population year after year, basically the urban slam approach, maintain the trees, save the benefits that are being provided, and minimize your costs. So I, I think basically these two tools, um, the iTrees program and the EAB cost calculator can be used very, very effectively uh, by the um, city planners, municipal planners, uh, to come up with scenarios, workable scenarios of what they need to do to prepare for the oncoming emerald ash borer invasion of their city. So these are the kind of tools we're trying to get our municipal foresters to focus on. Okay, I'm going to skip this for now. The other one, of course, is ALB, which we're uh, facing a lot of problems with. Uh, again, a lot of you guys uh, are dealing with this. Fortunately, we don't quite have it here in... Um, in Maryland yet, but I think this is simply a matter of time uh, before uh, many other jurisdictions are faced with this particular problem. So um, again, here's the map. You're familiar with this, and I, I don't want to dwell on it, but a map like this simply tells me when we're getting these kinds of detections in warehouses that it's simply a matter of time before these new borers show up in many, many different places. Now, one of the kind of all saws, the way to cut down on these um, these kind of um, oh very devastating or catastrophic losses in cities was to, of course, diversify. This is the lesson we supposedly learned on the heels of Dutch elm disease. But as I wandered around cities uh, in North America, I, I really didn't have the impression that that we'd done a very good job learning our lesson. So. I obtained uh, surveys for these 12 cities here. 
I plotted out uh, the tree populations and what I learned was the following. On the heels of Dutch elm disease, what we did basically was create cities of maple and fraxinus. Uh, ash on the heels of uh, Dutch elm disease. And as it turned out, gang, I don't think this was a very good idea. Um, because as you guys well know, maple, ash, elm, uh, sycamores, uh, celtus, things like that are all very good, very good hosts either for the emerald ash borer or the Asian longhorn beetle. Uh, so right now, in my opinion, at least east of the Mississippi, we're looking at an urban forest that is about 50% uh, susceptible to these two um, borers alone. So uh, for you youngsters listening in today, uh, our generation has managed to fumble the ball again here. So what I would encourage is you youngsters out there to get it right finally and try to incorporate uh, true biodiversity at all levels into our urban forester. So if anybody can make that change, uh, good work, go for it, because uh, we certainly have not been able to get it right so far, in my opinion. Now, in terms of the emerald ash borer, uh, I talked about the, the 8 billion trees that were at risk here, and that's bad enough. But I think the other piece of this puzzle we have to keep in mind is that it's not just the ash trees that disappear. There are at least 20 and perhaps 40 other species of insects associated with ash here in North America. And when these ash disappear, so will that community. So it's, it's not simply ash trees going down the toilet. It's the entire community of organisms associated with ash that we need to be concerned about here. Now here's a crazy idea. Uh, if ash trees are going to disappear, should we now begin to consider, particularly in urban habitats, things like the Manchurian ash? Could these be imported and used now as an ark to preserve some of these native insects from extinction? Well, some people aren't going to like that notion, are they? But I just really wonder if maybe uh, these are the types of things that should be considered. Or as Catherine uh, put in uh, in an earlier comment, um, basically I think we need to also look at the good resistant genes that might be in things like Manchurian ash and see if we can incorporate those into some of our native species here. Okay, very interesting read I think everybody should have a peek at as is this uh, article by Davis et al. in Nature. Uh, I think we, it's time to give up this, this kind of native exotic plant uh, issue, perhaps, and focus more, uh, I think, on what, what these different things contribute to, in terms of ecosystem processes to the environment. Now, I'm talking about native and exotic plants, not the, of course, the invasive insects. But I think, and, and again, I'm not a fan of invasive exotic plants either. But I think the important thing we have to do now is begin to focus on ecosystem processes and ecosystem services rather than what label a plant carries. And I, I encourage everybody to read this interesting article by Davis in Nature. Okay, what else have we got coming? Well, gang, uh, it never stops. And this is an interesting example, of course, thousand canker, you're familiar with this. Uh, this particular problem, I think, has arisen because what's happened as we have moved our East Coast um, black walnut trees into the uh, Gulf states and into the western states, what we did was we provided a natural bridge or an unnatural bridge uh, to the Arizona walnuts, uh, the walnuts that were basically the indigenous hosts or the evolved hosts of these different kinds of egregious pests. Uh, the fungal disease that's behind thousand canker and of course its vector. So even within North America, what I'm saying here, gang, is we can have these mismatches where we put things that once had disjunct reins into close contact with, an, with uh, other species and form a bridge 
and uh, even though it's it's not a case of a native and exotic uh, from a different continent, these kind of mismatches will take place as we move plant materials around North America even. So, Thousand Canker, it's another one we've got to deal with. Whitney Crenshaw and his group are doing some fantastic work on this, of course. I don't want to go into the, uh, I don't really have time because I'm starting to run short already here, but uh, great work being done on Thousand Cankers right now. Um, the last thing uh, that I will mention, of course, is when we have native plants and exotic plants in that ecological matrix I talked about before. Uh, you know, we have things like camphor beetles, uh, granulated and boja beetle, gypsy moth, uh, thrips, chili thrips, uh, brown marmorated stink bugs. So we have this whole host of things where we don't have the evolutionary history. We have a native plant, we bring in an exotic pest, and our plants simply get clobbered. Uh, another one on the front here, of course, we're beginning to see problems now with the Japanese cedar longhorn beetle. Um, there's a, an article I wrote uh, for uh, Tree Care Industry, I think earlier this year, that talks about this particular situation. This is not going to be good. It's got a pretty big host range, and it's now moving uh, from the East Coast to other parts of the country. Uh, granulate ambrosia, I've already mentioned that. So again, the list simply goes on and on. Uh, many of you will be dealing now with the brown marmorated stink bug. Uh, initially, when this was first introduced uh, into uh, Allentown, Pennsylvania, uh, back in the middle 1990s, we thought it would uh, be primarily uh, and simply a nuisance pest that might invade people's homes. But around 2010 here, 28, 29 here in West Virginia and Maryland, uh, Delaware, Pennsylvania, it began to be a serious crop pest, not only in fruit orchards, but also in row crops, things like corn, uh, vineyards, uh, soybeans, and uh, in people's uh, backyard gardens. I think this has now been detected in about 40 states. I think many of you folks that are listening to this uh, are aware of this particular pest. Uh, this is uh, one thing that I'm spending a lot of my time on. The eggs are very unusual. The first time I saw these, I thought they were lep eggs. Um, it's got five nymphal instars. Um, basically, uh, pretty easy to tell this guy because uh, it's got stripes on the antenna. This is the most... Uh, Oh, the easiest way, I should say, to determine um, uh, the brown marmorated stink bug from other stink bugs that we might find on our, our plants here. And those stripes on the antenna uh, will maintain all the way through from the first instars to the adult. Um, the life cycle, as I've already mentioned, um, they feed on plants during the summertime. In the winter, they'll seek out uh, protected locations under the bark of trees and rocky outcroppings, but they really like to get in people's houses. So it's like a great tsunami now. The invasion has already started this year. Uh, they're starting to come in. The tide will come in in the autumn, and it'll flow back out in March through June when these guys try to leave people's homes, and it creates a secondary problem there. I'm going to skip this one. Uh, as I've already mentioned, uh, they're major pests and lots of different types of vegetables. The concern, I think, is that here, when they were first detected uh, in Pennsylvania and New Jersey, we thought they'd be univoltine with a single um, with a single generation. We now know that they will have at least two generations here in Maryland and West Virginia. The real concern is in southern China where they're up to six generations. So I think as they move into the south, we're really going to be concerned. It's not unusual to see aggregations like this. There were more than a million stink bugs in this particular aggregation on the side of a house. Uh, again, they've got these strange movements between crops. They basically are tracking different resources through time. And in autumn, we found that they begin to feed on the bark of trees. They're actually feeding through the bark of trees on the vascular tissues beneath. We've got a study underway to find out what this exactly means. We're not really sure. 
Uh, as I've mentioned, they will come in the houses by the bajillions. They cause staining on the exterior before they come in. My buddy Doug Inkley was able to trap 26,000 stink bugs in his home between the 1st of January and the 18th of June in 2011. That's more than a nuisance pest in my opinion. Here's where Doug's house is. As I mentioned, these stink bugs like to overwinter in places like mountains, uh, in forests. They like to summer in agricultural fields. And Doug's house is surrounded uh, by agricultural fields, corn and soybean. Let me show you a little closer graphic here. Here's Doug's house. Here's where they overwinter. Here's where they feed. Here's Doug's house. It's the perfect storm. So if you have clients or you live in places that have this kind of situation, get ready for the stink bugs. Okay. I mentioned they feed through the bark of trees. Uh, this We don't really know what this means yet. It will attract lots of different kind of stinging insects. I worry that it may be the entry point for important diseases like xylella. We're going to try to investigate that a little bit more. We now know through some great work done by Du Young Lee, uh, he's Tracy Lesky's postdoc, that they overwinter primarily under the bark of trees. Oops, keep going here. Um, but what my concern is that in many cases, these forest ecosystems look a lot like our managed ecosystems. So what this means to me is that homes uh, that are surrounded by trees provide uh, habitat and uh, for these stink bugs to feed on, and then they're moving inside. So a lot of my research right now is directed towards finding what this means. In other words, we're evaluating different types of um, plant material to find out if we can actually create stink bug resistant landscapes. In other words, by planting non-favored hosts for stink bugs, can we actually manipulate these ecosystems and reduce the number of stink bugs ultimately that will come into people's homes? In these studies, what we found is that the more you look, the more different hosts you find. We've now expanded the host list, woody host list, to well past 200 species and cultivars. This isn't particularly good news. Uh, these are our study sites in commercial nurseries. But here is the good news. Uh, there are a number of hosts that we never observe stink bug eggs on. About 63% of the hosts in, in these commercial nurseries uh, basically were not used as oviposition sites. The news isn't quite so good for the active feeding stages, the nymphs and adults. There are only about 16% of the woody plants that we found to be non-hosts for the adults. Now, if you want to have stink bugs in your landscape, here's what you plant. Uh, again, if, if you really want to have them coming in, plant lilacs, maples, uh, red buds, uh, cladastrus, plane trees, sour gum, uh, tupelo, and cherries. These, this is basically the top 10 host list for adults. So again, avoid these plants. And, and gang, as you can see, the bad news here is this list includes not only um, non-native species like Syringa uh, pecanensis, but also several native species like Acer rubrum and Circus canadensis. So this guy is not going to discriminate, I don't think. This one is going to be a species that goes um, b uh, both to native and non-native hosts. Uh, it's, a, it's a true generalist. The top five hosts for egg masses were Avodia, Cornus, uh, Cladrastus, Yellowwood, Tilia, and Circus canadensis. Again, a couple of my favorite plants, not good news. Cultivars not used, and glance at this list again for the sake of time. Uh, we're getting a little long, and I'm going to kind of rush this through. But it's very curious that even within the genus Acer, we are ser seeing certain cultivars that are not used. David Eye, Palmatums. Uh, this is good news, I think. 
Uh, what I also want to point out is that many of the narrow-leafed evergreens, many gymnosperms, things like metasequoias, Pisces, Thuyas, Cedrus, uh, these are going to be potentially not hosts. So um, basically these, uh, these particular stink bugs are not using uh, conifers that much for hosts. And again, this could provide us uh, a little bit of relief in terms of managing this these uh, this particular pest okay so uh, the other piece of the story of course which you're all aware of uh, are the uh, USDA uh, search for um, exotic natural enemies uh, that can be um, imported and uh, there's another uh, good effort underway to find uh, not only exotic parasitoids, but we now know that many of the native parasitoids are also switching over and using BMSB for as hosts. In some cases, the rates of this parasitism, uh, this is work being done by Ashley Jones and Paula Shrewsbury, the rates of parasitism can be as high as 28 to 30 percent. So some good news here. Many of our predators have switched over, things like the wheel bug, many different kinds of spiders are now taking these guys. Uh, Chrysopids have been seen eating eggs and early and star nymphs, and praying mantises of a variety, including the, including the European mantid, the Carolina mantid, and uh, the Chinese mantid, all like stink bugs. Uh, Asylid flies are taking them, so there, there appears to be a lot of good natural biological control that may give a little bit of pushback to this particular invasive pest. Okay, with that, I'm at the credit slide. Uh, let me see if I have anything else left here. No. Well, that's about it. That's kind of my take on the uh, this invasive species uh, context and, and problem we have. Uh, again, for old guys like me, uh, you know, I think 15 years ago we were sitting around wondering what was next. Uh, now we know that we have job security for the rest of our careers. Uh, again, I see somebody said there, there's nobody under 30 in this group here. Well, maybe not, but even for those guys that are kind of uh, at that uh, border, uh, one thing is for sure is you've got job security for the rest of your life if you work with invasive species because, in my opinion, this simply is not going away. So with that, I hope that uh, I've stimulated some thought. I, hey, Diane, all right, you go, Di. You fix it. So um, hopefully uh, you guys have learned something today. Uh, I hope you've enjoyed this. Uh, again, any mistakes in anything here are mine. Anything that was good, of course, is the work done by the grad students and postdocs. So with that, I'll, I'll open it up to questions if we have any more time. Thanks, Amy. I think that there is one question here. Okay. Um, do we know how well the high service the native species yeah the hybrid I uh, native yeah let me let me see if I can scroll back to that the hybrid unfortunately uh, long answer short I'm pretty sure in the Manchurian you refer referring to the uh, EAB work being done by Eric and uh, and Dan Herms and that crew let me skip back it's quite a way back in the thing but I'm I'm quite sure that the man the Manchurica and I can't recall if it was a green ash or a um, white ash cross. But unfortunately, in the first crosses that were being done, I know that they, they didn't really see that resistance they were hoping for. So uh, as I understand it, here we go. I just skipped past it. Let me bring that image up. I think it's this one right here. Yeah, you can see the, the Manchurian black ash uh, cross uh, didn't work out. But I know that Dan has a major project underway right now. Thank you, uh, Greg. I know that um, uh, Dan and his folks are looking at several different cultivars right now. So hopefully in a couple years, 
um, will be a little bit further down with this one. But I, I really think it's time to consider, you know, uh, especially in the urban area, uh, bringing in uh, that Manchurian ash. I mean, it's a darn good looking ash. It's going to be resistant. And I'm really concerned about the loss of these other native species if all our native ashes go away. So I think we need to think of these as perhaps arcs or zoos for some of this biodiversity that's co-evolved um, co -evolved with uh, Fraxinus here in North America. So that might be a zany idea, but um, uh, it's one we should consider, I think. Robin, do we have anything else? I guess I'm done. I'm going to bring up the slide um, so that folks can uh, participate in our survey. Oh, OK. Yeah, uh, Shelley, are Manchurian ash susceptible to native borers? Great question. Uh, the answer is yes. We're, we're, we've got a paper submitted right now that basically shows that the Manchurian is going to be a host for the banded ash clear wing and probably also for the ash lilac borer. But again, um, uh, these, these I think, uh, we've got the mismatch, so we're, we're concerned about this, but I think those two pests are pretty manageable. Uh, I don't think it's hard to, um, to manage either of these borers. We've got really good materials, and uh, they just don't have the same kind of damage potential. They really feed on a different tissue, for the most part, Shelley. Uh, than the EAB. Uh, these guys tend to go a little bit deeper and don't do as much cambium damage uh, and phloem damage as the uh, EAB does. So even though they'll feed on it, they're not nearly uh, the kind of lethal problem I think the EAB is. I hope that answers your question. Uh, oh, it's Sally. Oh, uh, yeah, Sally? Shelly. Shelly, thank you. I got a Sally on here too. What about preliminary results with biological in the release states? Uh, Greg, it's not out yet. Uh, it's still up in quarantine up at the, the lab up in Newark, Delaware. Uh, if all things work out well, I think that this will be um, uh, available for release. I think what um, Kim Homer is saying, maybe in a year or two. So we still got to sit on this one a little bit. <laughs> 